Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Why don't we just take a moment and arrive here fully? I have a couple of announcements, if I can remember them. Yeah, just take a moment and, and get yourself here. So uh, for those of you on the retreat, uh, I sent out an email about uh, 10 minutes ago and it should have uh, the retreat videos. So if you didn't get that and you were on the retreat, uh, just email me and let me know. I look forward to uh, seeing you all Wednesday nights for meditation and those of you in the Kundalini group on Fridays. Uh, it's been a nice way to connect. So I'm thinking about putting together a uh, probably a Wednesday morning meditation for those in the US and uh, perhaps uh, an, an invitation for folks in Europe to be able to meditate at a reasonable hour. I, I'm not, I haven't nailed down Wednesday, but it'll probably be that day, but uh, we'll find time for the Europeans to, uh, to meditate. It's a powerful uh, transmission to be able to step into this. It'll be another opportunity um, for those of you uh, who have a little flexibility with your schedule uh, to connect as well. So um, my schedule is, has gotten so backed up. I think I'm booking into July now. I'm trying to do more groups uh, so that I can connect with more people. And I think that's just gonna be what's, uh, what's happening. So if you want to meet with me, schedule something uh, sooner rather than later. So, yeah, good, let's do this. Uh, again, let's just close our eyes. Feel into the body. In the most intimate way, the most loving way. Just asking the body, how are you doing? And you may begin to notice that as soon as you begin to listen and open and go inward, things begin to soften and loosen up. So again, just feeling into the body, the muscles of the face, the jaw, the shoulders, the chest, the solar plexus, the hara, the back, the spine, feeling into the physical body, as well as the subtle energetic body. And right away, just noticing what happens. When we invite awareness to wake up throughout the body. It's a gentle, compassionate question. How are you doing? And if there's struggle or pain there, we're just inviting it to soften, 
to release. To unravel in this space of presence. The presence is actually here before the body. This presence has enough space and love and compassion to include the body. feeling into these two basic truths, that your presence predates the body. And yet has enough love, spaciousness, compassion, to include the body. Your job is very simple, just to breathe. Deep, full belly breaths. And we feel And we open. We open to our presence, our radiance. We open to this gentle compassion that we are. We open to the direct experience of love. Spaciousness and peace. You may notice the more fully you connect with your presence. You may notice the feeling of nobility coming forward. Like a quiet strength and power. The very love of God flowing through you and as you. The very fabric, the very nature of your presence. love, spaciousness, peace, quiet strength.
But again, from this place in the most loving way, asking your body, physical body, subtle body. So what do you need? How can I help? Inviting waves of relaxation and letting go to flow throughout the body, throughout the nervous system. What do you need? And if you cannot find these healing qualities within yourself. I invite you to open yourself to the grace of God. Say, Lord, I cannot do this life. I get confused. I get overwhelmed. Sometimes I fall on my face. I'm stumbling around in the mud here. Will you open me and flood me with your grace, your light, your love, your peace and strength? And so we welcome this. We welcome support. Yeah, so just breathe that in, soak that in. You waking up to you. And you loving you. The God you, the human you, receiving. Receiving support. Gently soaking it in. And so I encourage you just to keep opening and breathing and feeling. I'm going to transition now to the questions. And uh, for those of you who emailed me a question, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. I have. Uh, I think some of the questions here, I'm not sure I have them all. Or if you want to raise your hand and speak with me, uh, we welcome this as well. And I'd love to hear from some, some new faces. Uh, I was just cleaning out my email, going through my emails, something I'm not very <laughs> good at doing. I just get so backed up, but... Um, some of you sent me some really kind and sweet emails. So I want to just I want to thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, they're, they're really touching. Really touching. And some uh, <laughs> some weeks people uh, write mean things about me on YouTube. And this week people are writing really kind things. And so Thank you for that, uh, for the kindness, and uh, I welcome criticism as well. Those things I need to adjust. Uh, some people go a little far with their uh, they're giving me a little too much credit, and 
you know, I, I was thinking about this the other night. Um, how my my experience of being human is most of the time I just feel like a kid and and or a nobody, <laughs> just like Mr. Nobody. And sometimes people give me these great compliments. And I say, oh my God, you know, these this compliment is is uh, should go to God. Please, you know, please praise God before you, before you praise me. Uh, I just feel like a big open space. And sometimes God shines through this open space. And like on this retreat we had, so much power and grace came. But it wasn't coming from Craig. It was coming from God from God. And so I want to make sure I'm clear <laughs> and give credit to where credit is due. You know, I'm just this empty thing. <laughs> and sometimes when we come together and you're empty, big things can flow through you, can flow through you. Um, but most of the time, I just think of myself is this young guy. I look in the mirror and I see all this gray hair and I realize maybe I'm not so young. <laughs> so anyways, uh, here's a question from Nick and this is, a, this is a great question. And the question is, Craig, what is the link between self-realization and healing? And you know, David O'Brien said something really, you know, brilliant this, this last week. I can't even remember where it was, whether it was in Satsang or in um, maybe the Kundalini group. But David, uh, you know, he has a background of being a fighter, which I think is just awesome. <laughs> I love it when people uh, come to the realm of spirituality and they're not uh, just a wet noodle. Um, and he said, you know, he's used to training a lot. And he said he can do, you know, 30 pull-ups. I think my record was I could, I could, I could do 14 in a row. But, uh, you know, I used to try to do 30 or 40 uh, throughout the day. And David said that he was listening to his body. And basically his body said, like, don't do that. Like this hurts or this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel good, you know, to be doing so many pull-ups. And this is the link between self-realization and healing is when you listen to your body, when you listen to your body, when you listen to the voice of truth within you, that's the doorway to self-realization. Like when you learn to listen to the depth of your being, and we're walking in the direction of self-realization. Even if you take a small step and just listen to your body and stop, be compassionate toward it. You're walking in the direction of self-realization because compassion is beginning to wake up. And in the same way, when you listen to your body, we're stepping into the realm of healing. But if you don't listen internally, intuitively, subtly, overtly, <laughs> if you don't listen, you'll never be awake and you'll never heal and you're never you'll never heal and when you live with chronic pain or great difficulty or great suffering and you ignore this if you just ignore your own pain you're not being compassionate you're not being awake 
You're living in the, the flight response, which is the opposite of being realized. So a great question for many of us is, can we stop? Can we put down our phones? Can we put down our devices? Can we put down our busyness? And can we listen to what's here right now? What's here right now? And yeah, this last week, um, my body just got really beat up. I think I did a little too much jujitsu, a little too much mountain biking, and um, by a little too much working. And I woke up this morning and, um, and my body felt like, you know, like 50 bucks, <laughs> you know, like sometimes our body can feel like a million bucks. <laughs> you know, if we go on a five day yoga retreat or something, we'll feel like a million bucks. But this morning I woke up, my body felt like 50 bucks. And so, because I listened to myself, you know, instead of getting up and um, you know, going into, the, you know, doing some kickboxing, I got up and I did some yoga because that's what my body wanted. And I, as soon as I put my head down in child's pose, I noticed these, there's the body grieving, like these tears coming forward. And so I just laid there for a while and just let the tears come. And for me, you know, tears are simply an unraveling of tension. Like it's one of the ways tension unravels is through tears. It's one of the ways uh, that veils unravel, like yogic veils, is through tears. And I was just noticing like my body is hurting. <laughs> and when you're open, it's very easy to laugh and it's very easy to cry. And it's very easy to laugh and it's very easy to cry, you know? Um, so you just let the energies flow. So when you listen, you can just let energies flow. You know, one of my old, um, one of my oldest friends here in Durango, a guy I've known for 20 something years, uh, he's this old Rasta guy. And uh, he, he, he plays this game where he makes memes. And uh, he's friends with my little brother, uh, who's not so little, <laughs> my, and my friend Jeff. And he's he'll take their faces, you know, like he'll take a picture of them and take their face and put it on like a different body with some, you know, silly quote or something. And uh, you know, they've been playing these jokes, you know where uh, my friend Tom is just making these memes. And he started to add, you know, my picture uh, to the memes. And so he had a picture of me uh, looking tough and sweaty at, you know, from jujitsu one night. And then he's pasting it on all these bodies of different wrestlers who are really ripped or, you know, really obese or whatever it is. And uh, just having a good old time you know, good old time uh, making fun of me. And, you know, my wife, she came in the room and I was just laughing hysterically, just like deep guttural laughs. of just seeing these memes that my friend Tommy's making of me. And I was laughing hysterically. And see, when we're open, we can laugh easily, <laughs> we can cry easily. When you listen to yourself, feelings simply flow. Feelings simply flow. They flow. And when things can flow, you, your consciousness doesn't get so clogged up with heaviness. With heaviness. And if our consciousness is not clogged up, and it's easy to remain awake. 
And some people, they teach that healing and realization are two different things. And that is true. Like knowing what you are is different than healing your human self. That's true. But if you know what you are and you live with a body that doesn't work, that doesn't function, if you live with a mind that's highly neurotic, if you live with an emotional nature that's a mess, you will create karma for others. You'll create karma for yourself and you'll find yourself tripping all over yourself, <laughs> tripping all over the character of Craig or the character of whatever, you know, whatever character <laughs> is with you, is with you. And so, you know, I place a great value on, on self-realization and healing and doing them simultaneously simultaneously. And there was a great uh, Tibetan master once and uh, he was incredibly realized, but he hadn't done his healing work. He had tremendous trauma around fleeing Tibet and he died an alcoholic. And to me, it's, you know, it's quite unfortunate. You know, to be greatly realized <laughs> and also <laughs> you know, drinking every night or whatever, dying of alcoholism. <laughs> and so it's important that we listen, you know, like David O'Brien was reminding us to listen, listen to your body. It's a great act of compassion for you to listen, for you to listen. And what you'll find is your heart will speak to you throughout the day. Any decision you ever have to make, your heart will tell you the way to go, the direction to go. And when you realized this voice of the heart becomes the one voice within you. But in order to listen to the heart, oftentimes we have to heal the pain that covers the heart. So anyways, beautiful question, Nick. Uh, it's, it's something that I've dedicated my life to is this question and in this intersection of healing and realization. It's very powerful. And the consequences are great if you ignore one or the other. <laughs> yeah, like I've hung out with, uh, say too many health nuts and they're just like crazy neurotic about what they eat and uh, you know so they're trying to heal through diet or through exercise or through this but then they are living in the illusion of i am the body i am the body versus the truth that i am the presence and I have a body, <laughs> just like I have a car, <laughs> I have a body. And uh, you know, we wanna make sure we, we have that one straight. We have that one straight. So anyways, uh, let's hear from Kyle. Kyle, are you here? Yeah, Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is about if you catch yourself, um, say in the ego or the thinking mind, um, especially like during the during the day or at work, um, it's that split second of catching yourself. I'm wondering where to put attention at at that point. Um, I think. Lately, I've been practicing either putting it in uh, attention in my hara uh, or uh, 
feeling the crown chakra or like the spaciousness of the crown chakra. Um, yeah, that's the nature of my question. Yeah, Kyle, fill it out a little bit more. So when you say you catch yourself, are you up to no good? Are you getting in lots of trouble here? Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, just like, um, just overthinking or um, yeah, having, having even strong emotions as well feeling yeah. the emotions bubbling up yeah. um, or kind of subtle neuroses yeah. uh, or judgments. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Or, um, yeah. Beautiful. So all of those things that you described, uh, they all feel deficient in love. Isn't that true? Yeah. 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 So they're all places that are basically say, Hey, I'm not connected to love. <laughs> you know, like when we're overthinking, we're not feeling rooted in love. We're actually feeling rooted in fear. And so we could probably use some love. We could probably use some love. If there's judgment, yeah, we're rooted in fear. We could probably use some love. If we have a lot of intense emotions, well, yeah, we could probably use <laughs> we could probably use some love. <laughs> and so, you know, if there's any of these types of things that you're describing, uh, the first thing I like to do is begin to breathe deeply and just imagine holding these in a presence of love. In a presence of love. Now, if there's a lot of fear, I'm going to invite there to be love but also like a quiet sense of strength. And the strength will show up like, not like this, but more like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. So for overthinking and there's lots of fear, it's a deep full breath of love, but maybe with a mantra like, it's okay. It's okay. Overwhelming emotions, same thing, a deep full breath of radiant love, just holding the pain with a gentle reminder of it's okay, it's okay. And so then we're coming into these two great non-dual qualities of unconditional love and unconditional strength. And so anytime something comes forward that's difficult, uh, and I encourage you, Instead of saying, I catch myself, I want you to imagine that a child has come to you. A child has come to you and he is catching your attention. He's wanting your attention. He's begging you for support, for support. And almost always with anything you described, it's I need to feel loved and I need to feel safe. And so this is how we respond. We respond with love and a sense of safety, like it's okay. It's okay for you to be here. We wanna be very careful with um, quote unquote catching ourselves, because the last thing I want you to do is to make yourself wrong for being human. Like you're not wrong for having judgments, for having egotistical thoughts. If we want to blame anyone, let us blame God, who's the creator of the ego, <laughs> who's the creator of you know, quote unquote negativity or the creator of you know neurosis. <laughs> but it's not your fault. And so we want you to meet you with love. You to meet you with love. And as we meet, say, a judge or a critic with love, in a sense of, hey, it's okay, it's okay, just relax, relax. It's okay, let me hold you. When you hold a critic, the critic will melt and begin to transmute 
into discernment, the quality of discernment. Discernment. So there's a beautiful thing here in each of these, you know, egoic traits, or there's something good in it. And basically, it's just like a child coming, like saying, ah, I'm really confused. I'm really confused. I'm really confused. Can you help me? It's like, oh yeah, I can help you because I love you. I love you, ego. <laughs> I love you. You're not wrong. You're not bad. I love you. When you love an ego, it grows up and it turns into, uh, it transforms. It, it grows up and it grows into divine qualities. Divine qualities. All the aspects of ego. Was this helpful at all, Kyle? Yeah. Yeah, really helpful. I'm wondering, like, if you tune into love or tune into strength, um, do you tune, tune into, like, the heart chakra or the hara? Yeah. Or is it just, is it just an energy that's in presence? Yeah, both. Both. I mean, love is your nature, of course, and it's hard to tune into love <laughs> without finding the heart coming forward. You know, it's hard to tune into strength without finding the hara coming forward. But, um, you know, eventually when you do this enough, it's, it's just like breathing, you know? Like as soon as you breathe deeply, you automatically feel love. You don't have to think about love. Now, if we're first like learning yoga, and we've never connected to our heart, we might have to think about our heart or connect to our heart, or place hands on our heart and feeling the warmth of our heart. But eventually as the heart opens, like say the heart's just naturally open and you notice an ego of quality come forward. You know, as soon as you take a deep breath, love is already embracing the pain and strength is already holding it. And so, you know, like back to Nick's question of, of a realization and healing, if we look at, well, what is realization? Realization is knowing what you are. And, you know, that sounds like really nice and zipped up tight, but it's like, well, what am I? Oh, there's a quiet radiance that I am. But what is that radiance? Like, what is radiance made of? Oh, radiance is light. Okay. If I feel into this light, it's loving, it's compassionate. Oh, okay. So I'm light, I'm love, I'm compassion. If you feel into your radiance, it's also spacious and free. It's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm all these things. I'm all these things. And so the realization is you getting to know you. You getting to know you. And, you know, many teachers teach like the ego is bad and true nature is good. And we can get into this kind of really dualistic kind of thought or, or dualistic model about, you know, what we are. And I like a model that's rather that is based in humility. And it's like, what am I? I'm a child of God. I'm an incarnation of God. I'm an incarnation of divinity. And yes, God put us into these flesh bodies and gave us these <laughs> overactive egos that get carried away. But we don't want to blame and judge ourselves for that. And so with this presence of humility, it's very easy to embrace the ego and not to see the human as bad, but simply the human is something that we were given. Like when we're truly humble, we see, okay, like God gave us this. You know, like when I was um, 16 years old, um, I was given uh, 
in a sense, I was given. Uh, 1973 orange, red uh, VW Super Beetle it was my first car. And you know, like God gave me this vehicle. My parents, you know, my dad gave me this vehicle. And, you know, if you've ever been in a 1973 Super Beetle, you realize, oh, it doesn't really have heat. And, you know, the sh sh shift in that thing is like, shift in something really archaic and, you know, um, and it doesn't have defrost. Uh, it, it's something else, you know, driving a car like that. And in a similar way, like we're given, you know, this body that's archaic. We've been given a mind that's archaic, an operating system that's archaic. And can we be humble enough to know what we are in the depth of our being? So we get to know ourselves through our direct experience. Our direct experience. It's like, well, what am I directly? Well, I'm spacious, I'm radiant, I'm loving, I'm powerful, indestructible. And yet I'm driving around in this thing that, you know, has all these crazy thoughts. All these crazy thoughts. It doesn't work so well. But we still want to love it. You know, because as we love it, it grows. And it starts to reflect more fully the nature of God, the nature of wisdom. And so anyways, nice to sit with you, Kyle. Yeah, good to have you. Yeah. All right. Um, does anyone else have a, a question here? Let's just take a peek around. Okay. Uh, Jacob. Hi, Jacob, are you here? Hi, Craig, hi. Hi, everyone else. Hi. I hope everyone's having a lovely day or night. Um, my question today is in regards to healing, and like, like what you said with the self-realization too. You know, are we in control of our healing? Can we speed up this process? Or is there you know, something else that's in control of that healing? Is there a divine timing, say, that's in control of that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Um, and Jacob's bringing up one of the most uh, frustrating experiences in my life um, around the timing of healing. And you know, the question is basically, are we in control of our healing? You know, there was this, this thing my teacher used to do, it was almost like he would pound this idea into us because there was a lot of people in, um, in this small group that I was in with my teacher. And basically there's 12 of us. And let's say 11 out of the 12 were healers. It's like everyone in the room was a healer. And the problem with being a healer is you think too much, like the, sh the shadow of being a healer is you think too much, I'm in control of the healing. I'm in control of the timing. I'm in control, I'm the doer. And my teacher used to like bang his fist on the table and say, God is the healer. God is the healer. And because all the healers in the room, they all had this big spiritual super ego that thought that they were the healer. And, and so, yes, of course, the timing is up to God. The timing's up to God. And, you know, one of the most frustrating things for me was um, Like as a kid, I always had a job. And so I always had some money in the bank. Like 
around all my friends. I used to be um, the one who'd loan out money, you know, because I had money. And right around the age of 20, uh, maybe 20, 21, 22, um, all of a sudden, you know, just something happened. We'll call it astrologically. And basically it was, Craig's not going to have any money for the next, you know, it was like 12 or 14 years. I can't remember what it was. And it was just brutal. But I did all the money healing stuff. <laughs> I read The Secret. I, you know, I read it. I ingested it. I took notes on it. I took all the money courses. I did the Tony Robbins and all that kind of stuff. You know stuff. I did the Deepak Chopra Seven Laws of Success, and um, I went to healer after healer who were just lifting karmic baggage off me, so that I could at least have enough money to not be, you know, you know. I, I it seemed like I was for like twelve years. I was either like ten or twenty thousand dollars in debt. It was just ridiculous debt. Um, is at some point, I think it was like, you know, 40 or $60,000 in debt and not owning anything. So it wasn't like I was in debt and owned a house. It was, you know, I was just, just in the negative. And I had these kids to support and, um, boy, I would get a little bit of money and, you know, uh, then all of a sudden the transmission would blow up in the truck or whatever. And like I said, it, it went on, I think it was 14 years of something ridiculous. And I can remember, you know, my astrologer, you know, she, she kind of looked at me and smiled. She said, oh, this is really good. Like your money problems are going to be over. <laughs> it's like you're coming out of a 14 year cycle or something stupid. And, and I was like, really? I was at a point where I couldn't even believe that it was going to end. It was just, it had went on so long and I had tried so much you know, so many different things. And again, anytime I got a little bit ahead, it was like God pulled the carpet out from under me. And that was purely like an astrological karmic thing. And I want to be clear here about karma. People really misunderstand karma and they think that if I say there's karma, that it means it's your fault. And, and and karma is not, like people teach karma as cause and effect, like you do this and this is going to happen. That's not really the truth of it. The way I look at karma is karma is more like God is moving things in one direction or another. And you can get in the, you can get in the flow of with, in the flow with it, or you can fight against it. But, you know, if God's going to make it happen, it's going to happen. And so I had this karma that I had to work out. It was a good thing. It kept me very humble. Uh, and, you know, like I just said, like I had to work it out. And working it out was not controlling it. Working it out was basically outliving it. Just outliving it. And so I did my part. I went to the workshops. I did the healing around it. I studied money and finance and this and that. But eventually, <laughs> I had to wait for the veil to lift, you know, purely astrologically. So that's one example. Now, a different example is, like, are we in control? It's like, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like, I had a friend, like, I was climbing a couple of years ago, and I was having trouble putting my harness on, and he looked at my belly. And he pointed at me and he laughed, you know, he laughed because I had an extra 20 pounds on me. <laughs> I had went out and I bought all new pants because nothing fit anymore. And um, like sometimes I'll look at pictures of me like, you know, three or four years ago. I'm like, oh, wow, I, you know, I had, you know, an extra 20 on me. And can I control that? Oh, absolutely. You know, I bike more, I exercise more, I do more yoga. I eat, you know, better uh, or eat less. And yeah, of course, of course. 
you know, like in regards to my body. Uh, if my body, you know, if my back is really beat up, I can do more yoga. And that is very helpful. You know, I can visit healers and a massage therapist and body workers. And again, this goes back to that, that listening. And this is something my teacher taught me. He said, Craig, you always put yourself last. So you don't value, you don't honor your body, Craig. And so it took me, you know, also probably a good 10, 15 years to learn to listen to my body. And so I don't like the word, like, are you in control of your healing? But uh, I, I like the, more that this idea, of there's some things you can do. You know, there's some things you can do to support yourself. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, that old thing Jesus said, you know, I can't remember, but someone else could probably quote it, but like, you can either give a man a fish or you can teach a man to fish. You teach someone to fish, like you give them a skill. And it's the same thing like with practice, with meditation. If you want to have a clear mind, learn to meditate. Learn to meditate. And so if you're spending time in silence, you're spending time with loving yourself, you're spending time like, you know, I was with Kyle just a moment ago and just like listening to oneself and the nature of your consciousness will change. That's healing. That's healing. But of course, there are some things that I found ridiculously frustrating, like <laughs> my experience with my finances where I had no money and I was doing everything right. So in theory, I was controlling, you know, I was doing everything Craig should have been doing, but it wasn't changing. And the reason it wasn't changing is because God was trying to teach me to trust and to have faith. To have faith that you are supported, Craig, with or without money. You are loved. You know, I am your sustenance. I am. That's what supports you, Craig. And again, it was frustrating. It was humiliating, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, a funny thing God did to me too at that time, and I tell this story often, is my two best friends, uh, both of them were like multimillionaires. And so I was like negative all this money. It's like so broke. And my two best friends at the time were so rich. <laughs> and they just, and I'll say this, I hope they're not listening, but, and they were not generous. <laughs> they were just, they would just look at me like, Craig, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have any money? And I was like, well, I wasn't born with a trust fund like you were. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that God, you know, sometimes God puts us through things. You know, the other thing I've had is like, I've had chronic pain most of my adult life. And it really brings you to the edge when like the ego tries to control and it tries to heal and you, you don't heal and you don't heal. There's actually a doorway there, a doorway of surrender that can really break one open. Like when you just come up against a, a limitation that will not change and you realize, okay, I can't do anything and you fall apart, but then you fall open. And that's one of the great gifts God has given me is these things that, you know, it's like where I'm banging my head up against concrete. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna get through this. But then I fall on my knees and then there's a different door that opens up. And it doesn't always mean the pain goes away, but I, I have an interesting experience of living with chronic pain, but also having just, you know, incredibly vast consciousness. It's, it's a bizarre way to live. <laughs> it's a bizarre way to live. Um, and sometimes things will leave, you know, for months at a time. And then they come back, you know, and I always smile. And go, I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you bring it back. And, you know, people oftentimes, um, if we play the control game, 
we tend to fall into you know fall into the trap of blaming oneself for doing it wrong and thinking we need to do it right or being too air you know being so arrogant thinking that we can heal anything and everything and you know we have to remember that you know, like every great master eventually comes face to face with something they cannot heal and then they leave the earthly body and like Ramana Maharshi had giant tumors you know, on his arm and his legs and just like all over his body. And it's like, okay, like sometimes things don't heal. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, with the time you think, okay, it's Ramana's time to go, go to heaven and just live in his, you know, his subtle body. So anyways, I hope that was helpful, Jacob. Yeah. Um, it's such a big question, healing. And, you know, it, it's interesting. Some people uh, come to me and they have a massive awakening experience and they think that pain will disappear forever. And um, it's normally not the case. You know, consciousness can expand forever. That, that's true. But uh, if you have a human body with a nervous system, uh, if you get, start to get old and you don't feel any pain <laughs> in the body, you know, of some sort, it's probably, you're probably not living inside the body. You're probably disassociated or not connected to the body. Um, and sometimes that's just an age thing. But normally the people who think... Uh, People get so shocked when they start to feel pain again, post awakening. And that's, you know, always funny to me because I'm like, how arrogant can you be to think that your body won't hurt? Like that your nerves will stop working. <laughs> so your body can be infused with bliss and you can experience the body as bliss, but you still have a nervous system. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the great rub of being human is you still have a nervous system. You still get tired, you still get hungry. So anyways, uh, okay, let's hear from uh, Kirsten. Kirsten, are you here? Yes, hi. Um, I, today I did a, a meditation with Jack O'Keefe um, mm -hmm. where we went from, we went back to beingness and then she tried to take us towards, um, I guess it's sort of like this beyond beingness to that kind of more nothing place or that more uh, empty place. And I was able to get there a little bit, but what I've noticed is I, I know how to abide in being. I actually can really hold being and the physicality of life. Um, this other kind of step beyond being is still a bit obscure for me, but I think I touched into it a bit. And I'm noticing a lot of just kind of strange sensations, like a, a band around just above my solar plexus, like on my lower ribs. And it just feels kind of weird. And I know that I need to breathe into it and I can do body work. But for some reason, I just wanted to ask if you had any guidance on that. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, so I'll say this. Um, so say when we go into the realm that you're describing, well, let's just call it like say beyond beyond and just a great emptiness or nothingness. There's, there's something, about, and I don't want to scare anyone, but I'll just say one of the things that often happens or maybe I'll say sometimes happens is when we step into this great emptiness the body and the superego will really relax in a deep and profound way. 
And when the body deeply and fully relaxes, you know, sometimes the movement of Kundalini can start to come forward. And so I just want to acknowledge that, that, that many people have awoke Kundalini through stepping into nothingness. They say, well, why did that happen? <laughs> you know, why, why did that happen? Because yeah, Kundalini is often taught it where you awaken it through, say, doing intense pranayama. But when the body's deeply relaxed, sometimes there's these places, these energetic locks within the seven chakra centers, they just start to kind of pop and open up. And sometimes they can just immediately open and there could be rushes of energy, which can be confusing because you're like, I thought I'm trying to be empty, now I'm not empty, but with these rushes of energy. And so that's one experience that's, that's we'll say, semi-common and unexpected. And in relation to that is like what you're describing where when we deeply relax the body, sometimes we notice just these bands of energy and it might be a band of tension. It might be just, you know, um, an energetic lock. You know, like the throat chakra is a very common lock. You know, this one here, one between the heart and the solar plexus, like you're describing. Uh, there's one in the um, pelvis. And so, you know, the, well, what's happening is just something's waking up. And it's a great question. And just can you be curious with it. And you see like, well, what is this? What's here? What's here? And when we listen, you know, if you feel a tension or a band of energy, you just might ask it like, what do you need? How can I help? It's a very just soft, gentle, what do you need? How can I help? And you might see it. If, if, it, if it's more tension, you might just see it as a doorway and just see if you can just invite all your awareness into it and just see if you can just like gently open that door and see what's on the other side. Now, the way we do this energetically, you know, say opening the doors, like you might just visualize that and see if that if it opens right up. But for most of us, we just have to sit with that band of energy. And at first, it probably won't talk to us, won't speak. It'll just speak to us in energy. So it'll show you there's tension here. Or it'll show you like there's a lot of light here. And it's important to notice what is your response to it? Am I fearful? Am I scared? Oh no, Craig said something about Kundalini and that's weird and I don't want to open that door. And so, you know, we have to be careful. Like, what are my, like, what kind of thoughts do I have about this? You know? And like, I can remember one day uh, through one of the experiences I was describing, say with Jacob, where I was just hitting this wall and then something broke and opened. And all of a sudden, it just felt like there was a halo around me. And I would just sit and meditate on that halo, just say, like, what is this? It was just like a band of light. It was like a little bit tense, but really brilliant. And as I opened into it, it was almost like I opened into a whole nother universe. And what you'll find is like with these, these bands of energy, again, it's a doorway to open to something greater. And just see, like, see what's there. See what this is about. And the only way you'll know is through sitting with it. Sitting with it. And after you sit with it for a while, then I want you to tell me what it is. Like I sat here with this thing. It was strange. It was bizarre. But then it started to open. And as it opened, it felt like I opened to this realm that was you know, very etheric and cloud-like, you know, but, you know, that was my experience. So you tell me what happens for you as you sit with it and see, you know, just see what comes forward. And so anytime something lights up, you know, in a similar way, like I was speaking to Kyle when I said, well, these aspects of ego are coming forward wanting your attention. 
you know, this band of energy as it lights up, you know, it's saying, hey, I want your attention. Will you sit with me? Will you open to me? Will you love me? Will you get to know me? And you'll see a whole new realm will open up inside. And you know, there's a good chance it'll be a quality of strength, a quality of power like you had not known about in the past. And this quality of strength and this quality of power, there's a good chance that it will have a, you know, like a, its own awakening kind of experience to it, but it will also have a healing experience to it, a healing experience. And so you play with it and you see, and then you let us know what it is what you discover. You know, whenever something like this comes forward, uh, I like to treat it with the utmost respect. Oh, it's like God is presenting me with a door to a most holy realm. And can I open this door and reclaim an aspect of myself? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, um, Richard, are you here? Hey. Hi, Richard. Hey, everyone. Good to see you. Good to be here. Um, yeah, today my question is around um, um, trying to figure out how to formulate it. Well, basically, um, it has to do with life asking you to do what you experience. It's just really difficult things. Like recently, I had to let go of someone who I really love. And it's, it wasn't just life made circumstances that we had to part. I had to let go of them. There was choice in it. Um, um, and that is way more difficult. That is way more difficult. Um, and, and there was a tremendous strength in it though, right? I was able to follow my spiritual heart and do what was right, right? And I kind of could reflect back to myself, spirit and kind of following what is true in me is more important than even a deep, deep, profound love. Um, and that's a big deal. But then on another e example, like I've been kind of like uh, guided or shown that walking in this particular way is more suitable for my energy body and my body. It's just better for me. But I kind of look like an alien when I do it. <laughs> um, and, and so there's a social aspect to it, right? People look at me strangely. People wonder what's going on. And then of course I've, you know, in the past few years discovered that I'm a non-binary person. Right. And it's appropriate for me to go out in dresses and all sorts of clothing feels totally right for me. And you can imagine I get looks from people. It's just a part of the experience. And and so, you know, I, I um, can appreciate some teachings that you've brought forward on this before in regards to like spirit is always inviting us to upgrade. And I experience all these things as upgrades right in my energy body and in my deeper spiritual heart. So that's true, that's true. And there is a deep coming into the hara, you could say. Like there's a strengthening in what's going on, um, leaning into these various things because they're appropriate for me. Um, um, and so I appreciate all of that. And I was wondering, and, and also it's difficult. It's difficult, right? Um, um, there's just an honesty in, in saying yeah. that and bearing witness to that. Um, and so I was just wondering if you had other things to, to speak into this. I would, I would really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, Richard. You too. Yeah. So, you know, when we look out at life, like when I was young on the path, oftentimes I would complain, you know, because... I would read a book about some great master and you know, th their story went something like this. They were a young kid 
like me. They went to the great master, like I did. The great master gave them the perfect teaching, like I received. <laughs> and the student in the book, uh, they put the teachings into practice perfectly, and they lived a perfectly enlightened life. I didn't find that to be the case with, with this one, <laughs> with me. You know, I, had the, I had a great teacher. Uh, I put the teachings into practice to the best of my ability, and life still hurt. Life was still messy. And out of the, you know, 300 spiritual books or whatever that I had read, uh, especially the yogic ones and the saintly, you know, the ones that from Christian mysticism. It just seemed like, you know, the guy, the gal, the individual, they took the teachings, they followed the teachings, and it all worked out great for them in one form or another. And the question I kept rubbing against is like, like my life hurts a lot. A lot. Like, it doesn't like just everything fall into place brilliantly and perfectly. You know, like Richard's describing, you know, I follow the truth and then I get funny looks. People don't always receive me fully. Don't always receive me fully. And, you know, within the, the spiritual ego, You know, or just a rational mind, there's a thought, if I do it right, then I should feel good. I should be received. I should be paid. I should be this or that. And I realized well, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> it didn't work that way for Jesus. You know, it didn't work that way for, you know, as I started to look at some of the more mature st spiritual stories, I say, I don't know, a lot of these people really greatly suffered. You know, a lot of them greatly suffered. It wasn't just, you know, they met the teacher, they followed the teachings, and then their life was perfect. You know, that's, <laughs> those are more of the mythological stories of the individual. But when you get to know the individual, you see, oh, yeah, they suffer. And the beautiful thing about life not working out, or the beautiful thing about just a slap in the face of pain, you know, physical pain or mental, emotional pain or rejection. And the beautiful thing about this world is it continually humbles us. It continually humbles us. And through that humility, you know, we're, we're just knocked open. We're knocked open through humility. It's like our heart just breaks and 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 then it just breaks open and it stays open. And then, you know, like Richard is describing, we hear the truth and we live the truth. We hear the truth and we live the truth. And we stop thinking about it. We stop thinking about it. If you ever hang out with a great master, you might notice this funny thing. They don't think, <laughs> which seems like an insult. <laughs> they don't think. They just follow the truth. They follow the truth. That's what they do. They don't think. They follow the truth follow the truth and that's a humbling experience just be like okay this is the way forward like they don't stop and say well how's that going to feel how will that feel for me who will be affected what will happen you know how will it turn out they just follow the truth there's like an innocence in it. You know, it's almost naive, but it's not. It's actually incredibly strong. 
you know, one of the ways my teacher described is you just become a slave to truth. And that's what freedom is. <laughs> you become a slave to truth. <laughs> and it's just a different type of way of living. A different type of way of living. And, you know, for the, the human aspects of us, like sometimes, uh, it's important just to take the time to grieve and just admit like, gosh, this world is hard. It's messy, it's difficult. Like I can remember grieving once it was, it's like, Craig, you cannot, make all these people happy around you and like and again i'll just say this about my life i live in a house full i'll say lots of girls and each of the girls has a different idea of what they want from their dad you know, or what they want from me and i can't make them all happy i can't keep them all happy you know sometimes one wants this and the other wants that and it's like I can't make them all happy. I can't satisfy them all. I can't say the right thing in every moment to them. I can't make them all happy. But at some point you just say, I have to follow the truth. Like that's the only thing I can do is follow the truth. And you, you just, it becomes easier. Like we, we get more comfortable with the consequences. And again, eventually there's just a silence around it of this is the way forward. This is the way. And in a human way, like it's okay to grieve sometimes. And when we grieve, it, you know, it's like an act of form of surrender of just admitting, okay, like God's in charge. <laughs> you know, like this is the deal. It hurts. And I'm going to be human enough to actually share my emotion and my pain. And that's good. It's good to have that and to continue to have that because again, it keeps you on that edge and then that doorway of humility. The first is being like a Zen robot who, you know, says things like it is what it is, you know, Max all tough about it. And that's, you can, you can really tell when it's a defense and when it's the truth. So when it's a defense, there's a harshness in it, a coldness in it, like a deadness in it, or a dogma in it. But when it's the truth, uh, like life is really heartbreaking. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really heartbreaking. It's what we're asked to do is um, kind of ridiculous, <laughs> kind of from one perspective, from one perspective. And a great joke from another perspective. So, anyways, um, much love, Richard. Yeah, much love. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah. Hans is asking, Craig, were you talking about Chogim Trump? Uh, I'll say this. Uh, he's one of the guys I was speaking about. Uh, I say that with a smile because there's been a, there's been a, a couple. <laughs> you know, there's been a couple. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know, sometimes after awakening, we still have major demons. I'll include myself in that one. Uh, I'll include myself in that one. Okay. Let's see here. Did I do my part? Make sure I got all the questions. I think so, unless anyone else has one. Looking through the chat here. OK. 
confused about the Facebook chat today. For some reason, I'm not seeing it. But anyways. And I'd like to do this just before we're, we're done this evening. It's just uh, maybe close your eyes. And just to notice what's awake right here. What's alive. What's vibrant and free. Right here, right now. What's awake, what's aware, what's alive, vibrant and free. What's the nature of your heart right now? Do you know your heart? Are you connected to your heart? Can you feel how much love How much love your heart is. How much love your heart is. Can you feel the bliss of the heart? It's very sweet, exquisite quality of Amrita. Like a nectar-like bliss in the heart. Can you feel that? That's quite beautiful, isn't it? I'm gonna invite you all just to the left to invite some of that Amrita to spread throughout your being. Spread up into your head, down into your belly, your arms, your hands, your legs, your feet. And if any of you are struggling with that, we'll invite some support from grace just to come into you and flow in the form of Amrita. A sweet nectar of bliss. And so, I invite you all to keep opening, keep connecting with that which is true and beautiful about your nature. So much love to each and every one of you. And thank you all for your donations and your support. Uh, thanks for all the love. Uh, thank you, Chad, for sharing your heart with me and all your support. Yeah, truly. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Love you all.